The most famous three words Ronald Reagan uttered while he was president were, trust but verify. But if you feel compelled to verify what other people tell you, why not just reduce this down to two words, don't trust. Mundane, an adjective meaning concerned with the commonplace, ordinary. Example, any conversation ever overheard on any public transportation vehicle. <sighs> Conserve, a verb meaning to keep and protect something from damage, change, or waste. Derivatives of the word include conservation. The protection, preservation, management, or restoration of wildlife and natural resources such as forest, soil, and water. Conservatory, a greenhouse for growing or displaying plants. And conservatism, a profit-driven ideology which seeks to exploit natural resources in ways that destroy forests and jungles, drive species out of existence, and threaten life on Earth through global warming. What? <gasps> huh? Oh no! Of course, there are those conservatives who deny that this is happening, thereby seeking to have their oil and burn it too. They are like ostriches named Nero, who fiddle with their heads in the sand while the world burns. Let me encourage them to start a new internet fad, following in the footsteps of planking, Owling and Tebowing. I call it tailpiping. Just start your gasoline powered car, wrap your lips around the tailpipe, take five deep breaths of exhaust fumes, then turn to a video camera and explain why global warming isn't happening. Hey, this could become the latest YouTube craze. While global warming progresses, the rising temperatures will produce many consequences that no one could foresee. Take the winter of 2011-2012, for example, when there was hardly any snow at all through the end of January. Who could have foretold what would happen as a result of that? And if this is January 28th, then what's wrong with this scene? <laughs> there comes a week every early spring as the snow melts but before the street sweepers and conscientious corner residents do their work when all the winter's accumulated litter at bus stops is revealed this includes items both large and small and there's some fast food litter. What the? Are you kidding me? <laughs> now aside from what littering itself has to say about human nature, one should note all the other bad habits people have which this practice reveals. Let's start with smoking. Come spring, there are more butts per square foot at a typical bus stop than on even the most crowded bus. And, of course, smoking is an undeniable hazard. And one can't help but notice a substantial number of alcoholic containers. Next up, are fast food containers and packaging. 
if you still have these in hand when you leave the establishment, is it really too hard to take them home and throw them in your own wastebasket, assuming you have one? Then there are plastic items, many of which could be recycled and all of which should be properly disposed of. It's especially troubling when people discard plastic bags which are inhabited by spirits that will listen to your every command. Okay bag, just keep rolling on now, but stop at that post. Okay, now keep going. Go on ahead. But turn right. Just stop at the sidewalk and come on back a little ways. Come on back. A little further. A little bit more. Maybe one more flip. And settle down. Okay, Mr. Bag Spirit, we're going to take you to the recycling center. As its name suggests, libertarianism holds that personal liberty is of the greatest importance and should not be abridged by any political or social authorities. In essence, this philosophy holds that people should be free to do things their own way in accordance with their personal state of knowledge and belief about any given situation. In such a world, individual choice reigns supreme. I am a libertarian. <laughs> that is, until someone else enters the room. Then I begin to see the need for a few rules. <laughs> Whether one is a passenger in a plane, cab, bus, subway train, ferry boat, or horse and buggy, a stimulating way to spend this downtime is by reading collections of aphorisms, familiar sayings, and proverbs. They're like mini candies for the mind. One of my favorite short sayings describes how much of life is subjective, our sense of aesthetics in particular. The saying I'm referring to, of course, is, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Inspired by these thought rainbows, here are a few of my own for your and John Bartlett's consideration. You should not let your dandelion seeds blow across your neighbor's lawn. Number four, to grow yourself a garden grand, do not seed your soil with grains of sand. Number three, poor cooks need not blame their pots. What? Nor poor writers their keyboards. Huh? Number two. Foolishness crouches beneath the tongue, ready to pounce when the lips part. <gasps> and number one. Home is where you are, when you are, what you are. Back in the very early days of public education TV, a kindly gentleman named Howard Hathaway frequently visited grade school classrooms in Minnesota to help students learn to speak Spanish. Students from those days remember him, of course, as Don Miguel. While Howard Hathaway is no longer with us, here to demonstrate some of his techniques is a latter-day Don Miguel. 
Let's see if this Don Miguel also hath a way with words. Hasta en tone seis nine nine seis repitan hasta en tone seis muy bien ho que tom como es tos repitan ho que tom como es tos muy bien mu chas Tracy ass Don Miguel. Repitan. Mu, Chaz, Gracie, Ass. Manana sera otro dia, hasta entonces. When I was a kid, I understood that certain things needed to be washed, dishes and hands mostly. But I've always maintained a certain moderation in this regard. When one understands that about a hundred trillion bacteria live in and around the human body, the need to achieve germ-free living seems to wane. But one day when I was six or seven and living in this yellow house, I looked up and there it was right across the street, a street sweeper. And I was astounded and enchanted. Imagine that. Someone and something that actually clean the streets. Streets that are normally cluttered with grit, grime, rocks, bugs, twigs, and of course litter. This experience made a lasting impression on me, so much so that to this day, nearly 60 years later, I note with a certain reverence those city workers who drive past my house every spring just to tidy up the street making it for the moment at least as neat and clean as some of the surface areas in my own house. This year I decided to try an experiment to see just how clean these street sweepers actually made the world right outside my front door. Okay, here comes the street cleaner. My first really desired for a job. Now let's try a little experiment here to see what how good of a job he did. There is, of course, the old five-second rule where if you drop something on the ground, you can pick it up within five seconds, although some people, of course, would never consider doing such a thing. So we'll put a cookie on the pavement and leave it there for three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and meanwhile, the other guy goes again. So there's our cookie on the ground. We'll even smash it down a little bit here. And let's see. Oh. 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 Tastes good. I mean, I can't complain. Tastes good to me. Yum. Thank you, Mr. Street Sweeper. You're the job I didn't get, but once upon a time wished I had. My old mailbox, trusty as well as rusty. Sort of like the post office itself, it still serves a function, but is not what it once was. There was a time when letters were of tremendous value as the only way to communicate directly with someone in a distant place. And many people would spend a great deal of time composing them. 
But with the advent of the telegraph and the telephone in particular, instantaneous communication became possible and the value of delivering massive missives began to fade. Personal letters became less frequent. Bills and advertisements more frequent. Illustrative of how letter writing was losing its cachet, no less a worldly authority than Ward Cleaver commented to his wife June in 1962 as he rifled through the day's mail, Remember when you used to get letters from people you knew? There was still a little wind left in the sails of letter writing during the late 1960s and early 1970s. That was a time when my high school friends who went off to college somewhere far away and I would actually handwrite and mail letters to one another. I still have a number of these correspondences tucked away in an old file folder. A lot of water has gone under the bridge since then, but they've now faded so far into the past that they've gained some value by virtue of their antiquity, so why throw them away? Back in those days, I was fond of the art and craft of letter writing, which I pursued with great verbosity. This led to my being the only one among my friends who seriously considered becoming a postal employee. The Vietnam War was still dividing the nation and, duly alienated, I had dropped down and out and was desperately in need of a job. I remember heading downtown one day to fill out a post office employment application form and walking along Robert Street to the intersection with Kellogg Boulevard, which is right here, on my way to the U.S. Post Office, which at the time was this beige-colored building, about a block and a half down the street, crossing over the intersection on my way, but then getting to this very point and suddenly being filled with negative thoughts, with angst, and balking at the very idea of going to work for the Post Office almost as if there was a red line drawn on the sidewalk that prevented me from crossing. Hey, it's still there. In time, I got a city rather than a post office job, but I've always wondered how different my life would have been if I'd walked those extra couple of blocks and filled out an application form. I was going to finish this segment with a clever joke I considered sending you in an envelope without a stamp, but figured you wouldn't get it. I'm warping our way into the future to show you a useful innovation that has become commonplace by the quarter century mark. By virtue of their futuristic qualities, and with a nod to Arthur Stanley Eddington who first came up with the concept, these devices are called Times Arrows, and many have been given a design to reflect their name. It's a voice recognition and response system that has been installed in virtually every intersection. It can interpret and respond quickly to any kind of question you ask it, and also fill in incomplete sentences with the most likely correct answer. Some even say it has some eerily human emotions. Let me demonstrate. We're here in 2025 with the Time Zero voice recognition system. You activate it with your thumbprint. Now it should be set to carry on a conversation. So Time Zero, what is it as you look at me standing here that I could stand to lose 10 pounds of. Wait. Yes, unfortunately that's true. Okay, the next one. This will be a fill in the blank in the middle of a sentence. When a person is depressed, what of the world rests on their shoulders? Weight. Yes, the weight of the world. Okay, now just one more for you here. There is a famous saying originally written by John Milton that was made famous by Churchill during World War II. So, fill in this sentence for us. 
They also serve who only stand and... Wait. Yes, wait. Okay, very good. Thank you, Time Zero. We'll uh, be back to you another day. On to the next segment. Wait. No, oh, I've got to go. Sorry. Got things to do. Next time. Wait, wait, wait. No, I. it's over. Okay, your star days are done. And uh, now I'm getting out of here. Wait, 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 wait. Once not too long ago, I decided to take a cooking class to see if I might like the activity. Valentine's Day was just ahead, and our instructor asked us to prepare something that would creatively express our affection for our significant other. After some thought, I assembled six items flour tortillas, olive oil, a kind of crumbly cheese I like, cumin, a cracker, and a piece of chocolate. I placed the crumbly cheese in the tortillas, added the cumin spice, and made these into rolls, which I sautéed in oil in a skillet. Next, I formed these rolls into the shape of a box, used the cracker to help make a lid, and placed the chocolate inside. I proudly presented my work to the instructor, thinking I had done well. She, however, really shot me down, saying, I didn't want you to make a feta roll case out of it. As gardeners well know, there are any number of products that garden centers want to sell us to help photosynthesis occur in our yard. One wonders how plants survived the past 750 million years without us. Among the fertilizers, there are the big three, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Although phosphorus has fallen into disfavor, since its runoff is clogging our ponds and lakes with algae. Hey, it's pea soup. Sharon! Now, despite all these products sold to us to make our gardens look beautiful and taste delicious, the hardest thing of all about gardening is getting plants not to grow. I'm a dog lover, and I've been one most of my life. When I was four, I figured the best way to get a puppy was to beg my parents for a baby brother, and it worked. When I was in third grade, a classmate told me his dog had more fur on one side than the other. I said, oh yeah, which side is that? And he said, the outside. In that regard, outside of a dog, a book can be man's best friend, but inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. Dogs are nearly perfect pets. They're playful and friendly, although, whoops. When you take them to public places, just be sure to follow the ground rules. At least in my neighborhood, the best indicator of whether a household owns dogs is whether they have one of these flat wooden panel fences that go up about six feet high, maybe seven feet. These keep the dogs inside, of course, but they allow the barks to come out. And because of their height, they also eliminate the need for the people who live here to see all the looks of scorn, which must be 
sent their way by people walking past peaceably. Dogs are tuned into others of their kind by smell, sight, and sound. When they live in separate yards and one dog barks, so does the one nearby, then the next one, and so on. A single bark can set off secondary, tertiary, and quaternary waves of barking before it leaves our auditory range. But who is to say this eruption of arfing ever ends? Dogs have much more acute hearing than people do, and of course some breeds bark much more loudly than others. So if you were to acquire just the right breed of dog, there could in theory be only six pedigrees of separation between you and Kevin Bacon. What can one say about New York City? Oh, there are a few things. It's a place that should adopt the motto, if you've got a horn, honk it. Some people there are billionaires, while others ask, hey buddy, can you spare a dime? In this city of blues, there are both great heights and great depths. In New York, people are drawn to the most mundane of places, sidewalks, while much more aesthetically pleasing spots are often left vacant. In New York City, there are lots of little old ladies walking along the streets carrying well-worn bags, but they seem to be outnumbered by attractive young women escorted by fluffy chow hounds. In a city where 800 languages fill an almost infinite number of thought balloons, the one concept which seems to elude everyone is the difference between walk and don't walk. A television show popular around 1960 used to introduce its episodes by saying, there are more than six million in the naked city. But that can't still be true, since there must be at least seven million clothing boutiques located in New York City today. However, when it comes to trying to find a serious-minded grocery store, a person is better off purchasing calories from one of the many nearby street vendors. And New York City is a place where the sun does, and in some cases never does, shine. New York City. If I can make it there, I can make my way back home, and I'm happy to have done both.